And I know I've talked about insulin resistance before, and it's a very hot topic. Lots and lots of podcasts and YouTube channels talking about this. But what I found is the great majority of my patients, and these are the most educated, most well-resourced women in the country, still don't really understand it enough to be making the changes that they need to get well. There's still so much confusion about it. So I want to try to alleviate some of that confusion today. Insulin resistance should be considered an illness on its own, independent of diabetes, because way before we reach any diagnosis of diabetes, or maybe we never do, we see a lot of illness like weight gain around the middle, inflammation, liver issues like fatty liver, which can lead to liver failure, increases the risk of heart disease dramatically, even Alzheimer's disease. Many, many things are affected without a diagnosis of diabetes. When we eat carbohydrates, they go into our stomach and are broken down into glucose and fructose. Now, glucose stimulates insulin, which is a fantastic hormone necessary for life, produced by our pancreas. Pancreas produces insulin, and insulin's job is to get that sugar normalized get it out of our bloodstream so that we don't develop high sugar. Our sugar metabolism is incredibly meticulously managed. On one side, we have insulin trying to get sugar out of our system. On the other side, our liver is able to not only release sugar from storage, but also to make sugar in a process called gluconeogenesis from non-carbohydrate sources like protein, fat, lactate, other things. In any case, the liver can make glucose and insulin on the other hand is trying to get it out of our system. So with the two dancing together, they're very, very clever at keeping our blood sugar very closely regulated until things go very wrong. Now, when they go very wrong and blood sugar is very high, we call that diabetes. But prior to that, way prior to that, maybe 20 years prior to that, we start seeing these changes developing that are already making us sick. Okay, so we know Insulin's job is to get that sugar out of our bloodstream to lower our sugar and get it into our cells so that it's available for energy. So by cells, I mean basically every cell in our body uses glucose for energy. So there's very complex mechanism by which this happens, but let's just say there's a little transporter that allows the glucose to get from the bloodstream into the cell. And very long story, very short, Insulin mediates that mechanism, and that mechanism starts to break down. There are many pathways by which this breakdown happens, but let's just say it stops working as well. So insulin is not able to get the sugar into the cells as it preferentially would like to do. One of the very important things that sugar should do is be stored in our muscle and liver for later use. That stored glucose is called glycogen and that's what allows us to wave our arms around when we're not actively eating to walk or maybe go for a one hour exercise routine for women we can store about a thousand calories of glucose as glycogen and then after that like if we were continuing to exercise or continuing to fast we start using fat and liver production of glucose to fuel our cells. In any case, we have some glucose stored as glycogen and we have some stored in fat cells, which is very necessary for what's called fat oxidation, which is a primary way of achieving energy release. So one of the interesting things about this process is that insulin stores glucose as fat and it puts it away, let's just say in a way that makes it much more difficult to later use for just the daily processes of fat oxidation. So what's happening with this high insulin that is not able to function, so we have hyperinsulinemia, high insulin in our blood, that's just sitting around waiting to grab that glucose and shove it into fat cells, which are going to store it in a way that's very difficult to burn later, rather than storing it in our muscle and liver as it should. So this is why we call insulin a fat storing hormone. That's the very, very basic idea of what happens. Well, when we keep doing this, eventually we bypass the ability of our fat cells to accept any more fat and we start storing fat in other places. We start storing fat in our muscle. You've seen steaks that have striations of fat. Um, muscle starts looking like that. It starts getting full of fat and in our liver. And you might have heard of fatty liver. So fatty liver is a process where our body is just trying to stuff this glucose anywhere. So it starts putting fat cells in our liver. 
Now, when we have fat in our liver, our liver doesn't work well. You know, that's a very short version of what actually happens, but the liver is not made to be full of fat. It does cause liver dysfunction, eventually even liver failure, and it's becoming one of the most common reasons for liver transplant. This is what we call metabolic-associated liver failure. So don't want that. And another interesting thing that happens when we get a lot of fat in our muscle it actually makes the process worse. So when we were already insulin resistant, when that mechanism of getting sugar into the muscle already wasn't working well, when we have a lot of fat in the muscle, let's just say it makes it even exponentially worse. So now we've got severe insulin resistance in our muscle. We're just not able to get the glucose into those healthy places and we're storing fat instead all over the place, not only in our tummy, but also in our liver and in our muscle. 